It says we are live. So welcome everyone to another Lake Talk event. It's been a few months because it's been summer, it's been fishing time, and hopefully like uh, the rest of, like me, like the rest of you, you're out on the water. So we're coming up to one of the most um, fun times of the season for Brian and I. Our air temperatures are starting to drop, the water temperatures are following, it's cool. It's time to get on the water. I always say it's the best of times and the worst of times rolled into one because Brian and I really look forward to the fall season. It's one of the best seasons of the year on the entire Stillwater calendar. However, Mother Nature has old man winter just around the corner. So it's not it's a short lived season and it's going to end kind of abruptly. Um, so anyway, so let's bring Brian in and let's talk about understanding the fall season and why we love the fall. Hi, Brian. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Phil, how are you? Good. Um, I guess I should mention everybody. Usually I do these Thursday night, but my esteemed colleague, uh, well, he wants to go uh, hunt some deer uh, later this week. So <laughs> bow hunting season is starting, I understand. Wednesday morning, I'll be sitting in the ground blind very okay. early. So I'll have fresh deer <laughs> hair by what? Saturday, Sunday, maybe? <laughs> I sure hope so. Then we can get back to fishing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we're sensitive to everybody's time, so we're going to try and keep this to about an hour. If you've got questions, uh, pop them into the comments section, uh, either on Facebook, if you're watching there, on my Phil Rowley Facebook, uh, Phil Rowley Fly Fishing Facebook channel, or my YouTube channel. Pop them in. We'll try and get to as many of them as we can. But let's get right into it. Um, the fall season, Brian. Why is fishing so good? Why do we love this season so much? You know, it, it all boils down to a hot summer and finally water temperatures dropping. And as those water temperatures drop, the metabolism of the fish increases. And they can come into shallower and shallower water because it's more oxygenated as the water, water temperatures cool. And they know trout and char go through the winter months you know just just ticking along you know they want to put on as much body fat as they can prior to the winter months because their that cold water reduces their metabolism to a subsistence level and so yeah it's the time of year like we have always said it's the mm -hmm. time of year when you can have fabulous fishing mm -hmm. short bursts during the day catch the biggest fish of the year but winter's just around the corner. Yeah, it's, that makes it tough because people have, you know, for the most part, the lakes are nowhere near as crowded as they are in the spring and summer months. People have gone, their holidays are over. Kids are back to school. Uh, other priorities take over, like hunting deer. We won't bug you about that too much. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, so there's, there's, no, there's not the big congestion at the lakes too. So a lot of times you've got the lake um to yourself until until the word gets out and then it can crowd up again so yeah. so what are we going to talk about tonight we're going to talk about obviously what's going on and you know what the changes are going on because the lake's transitioning from the summer period into fall and you and i both approach lakes from that biological point of view and uh so i, I think it's important for people to understand that and it helps guide where fish are going to be we'll talk about the food sources that uh, they're most likely to run across and this is yep. North America wide, so there's going to be some regional differences from time to time. You mentioned the feeding activity, the windows that, uh, the narrow windows that pop up uh, throughout the day. Talk a little bit about some of our favorite flies, our line choices we like to use, and the tactics we use with them. And we're going to try and answer as many questions as we can, both either just how we're discussing the items as they pop up, or if we've got time at the end. And if we don't get to them at the end, I'll do my best to um, answer them directly on either my YouTube or Facebook right. channel. And um, if you can't catch all of this, you got to go, or you're just coming in, or you got a friend that can't make it, These, this is being recorded. So it'll be available on both my YouTube channel and my Facebook channel, so you can watch it at your leisure anytime you want after. It'll stay up there for perpetuity and all that stuff. So, so again, Brian, you mentioned fish are sliding into the falls. Why don't we go over what's going to happen to the lakes? We're coming out of the summer doldrums, in some cases, I guess, in Western North America, Western Canada in particular. In your province, you've had quite the hot summer, haven't you? Yeah. So what's going to happen first is many lakes have developed algal blooms, and they may not be the, the blue-green blooms where you see that like, it looks like grass clippings in the water, but they've got small tiny little spheres in the water. And uh, 
what's going to happen first is as those surface water temperatures drop and we get less sunlight uh, length during the day, hours of sunlight during the day, the, the bloom is going to come to the surface and it's going to die off. So the lakes are going to get a little bit ugly. You'll see slicks of algae on the surface. And that's just telling you that the bloom is dying off. And we need that bloom to die off and uh, the water will eventually clear up. So not to panic. I know some of, a couple of my favorite lakes right now, there's, even though the surface temperatures are dropping down into the low 60s, even 61, 60 Fahrenheit, there's a pretty good bloom still on the lake. And that bloom has to die off prior to mid fall. And uh, so no panic, the lake is gonna clear up. It's just gonna take time. And uh, you know, the water temperatures are slowly dropping. And uh, it's interesting if you went out on the water tomorrow morning early, like say six o'clock in the morning, you would probably see fish is swimming around if it was a clear lake or you'd see them moving in five to ten feet of water it's cool enough at night now for the, those fish to come in and feed and they meet they'll be there for the very uh couple hours early in the morning and then they'll slide off because the water is going to work even right now the water temperatures are going up a couple of degrees during the day on a sunny day so they'll slide back off but they are uh, we're already seeing it on a on a number of lakes, the fish are in shallow water in the morning, early in the morning till, you know, nine o'clock, 9.30, sometimes even 10 o'clock, and then they disappear. So that's something to watch for. Yeah. So you mentioned the algae. Now think the days are gonna progress. Um, you know, I've had this graphic up, I'll run it again. Maybe Brian, you can walk them through what's gonna happen with, with as the temperatures cool, you know, as the temperatures lower, the water temperature drops, the lakes becomes the same temperature and, and starts to mix. Why don't we yeah. walk through, you know, take some of that mystery out of fall turnover yeah. and, and so, how important it is. Yeah, fall turnover is, is uh, not well understood by a lot of anglers. It's, it's an ecological phenomenon that occurs in all, all small trout lakes that uh, are in the north temperate zone for sure. Uh, and uh, it, it, it needs to happen. It, it mixes the lake and uh, prepares the lake for winter time. So right now, the, what you're seeing on the screen uh, would be a typical situation. Right now, late summer, there's still a thermocline. That, that's that uh, green uh, strip or bars going across the lake. Uh, and the fish are, in many situations, are going to be suspended just above the thermocline because there may not be a, enough oxygen below the thermocline in some lakes for them to, to be uh, comfortable. So they suspend down deep just above the thermocline where the water's cool and well oxygenated. So that thermocline usually is established anywhere from five to seven meters in depth. But as the water temperatures cool, the surface waters will cool down uh, so that they become similar to the temperatures of the water in the deeper part of the water column. And the magic number is when the lake becomes four degrees, when the, when the water temperature becomes four degrees centigrade or 39 degrees Fahrenheit, the lake will mix. The, at 39 degrees Fahrenheit, the water is most dense and it'll sink. The surface waters will sink down to the bottom. And then you add wind to the equation, and that's what mixes the entire water column. Breaks down that thermo thermocline is gone now. And now the entire lake is mixing, as you can see in this graphic. And it's going to supercharge the lake with oxygen from top to bottom. All that mixing, bringing up the less oxygenated water to the surface, exposing it to the air water interface. And the whole goal of false fall uh, turnover is to supercharge the lake with oxygen so that it's going to make it through the winter. It's going to set it up for winter when the lake freezes over and there's no further input of oxygen. That fall turnover event uh, is what is going to carry that lake 
through the winter months under that cover of ice. And so the key thing anglers need to remember about fall turnover is that you can be fishing a lake pre-turnover and fishing relatively clear water and then come back three days later and the water is going to be very turbid, a lot of detritus, debris uh, floating uh, throughout the water column and you know that lake is in turnover. And it's going to take five to seven days, potentially longer if the winds are strong and continues to blow, the lake will continue to mix and it'll continue to stir up, bring up uh, material from the bottom of the lake and keep it dirty. But eventually the lake is going to clear up. It's going to be cooler now, but that's definitely the sign when those fish are really going to be uh, feeding aggressively in ultra shallow water. Yeah, because it's really because understanding that it just helps you determine you know, eliminate sort of non-productive water, uh, perhaps a moving water term. And, and so it, it helps you put yourself in the right locations where the fish are going to be and where they're going to be happy and, and willing to feed and take our flies, right? Exactly. So much of fall, late fall fishing is visual, meaning you got to, you got to keep your eyes open. You got to see fish moving, jumping, flopping around. Because remember, we're done with all the major insect hatches. Early fall, you'll get a few chronomids still coming off. Of course, we get our Bowman and back swimmer falls. But beyond that, those those fish are have, have to start focusing on the bread and butter food sources like leeches and dragonflies and immature dragon damselflies, damselflies, scuds. They're all, that's the key uh, food items. Yeah. And, and their feeding changes, doesn't it? Because early, there's, there's, there's a season within a season, isn't there, in the fall? Early fall, kind of mid, and then right up until, you know, it gets really cold. As we, as we both joke, a lot of times how long your fall fishing lasts is entirely up to your pain tolerance for cold. Right? <laughs> that's when that's, big cayenne comes out, right? Brian's big, big no, puffy that's, jackets. <laughs> that's why I finally bought a heated vest. <laughs> and I have two battery packs. Yeah, so certainly... <laughs> When we say fall fishing, we really need to break it down into early fall, mid fall, and late fall. Because right now, you know, you're seeing on the lakes that you fish and I'm seeing, yeah. we're we're just on the doorstep of early fall. Yeah. Yesterday I saw the first back summers in Bowman, and I think you did too. Yep. The same thing early afternoon when the day is at the warmest. Yeah. Yeah. And so you know, seeing those back swimmer and boatman falls, that's that's the opening salvo to mm -hmm. fall fishing, but it's the early season. Remember, we've still got on a lot of lakes, still got algae, we still got that bloom to die off, but at least it tells you the lakes are cooling down and uh, they're all, the fish are only going to get more aggressive as the fall season progresses. So you, it can be pretty challenging fishing during the early fall. You, you know, or you know, in general, fall fishing. It's pretty. I think it's pretty safe to categorize that in fall fishing. You, you know, we're we're going to get numerous short bites during the day, uh, and uh, that's why you want to be prepared to stay on the water for the entire day because you're going to miss it. I know. Uh, I was fishing Roche Lake, my my favorite lake, the other day. And I, my friend was on it too, and uh, I had to, I had to leave early, and so I left at uh, two o'clock, and he fished until five, and he said from four to five, the fishing was crazy, and then we had two good bites earlier in the day, and then there was a lull right until almost four o'clock, um, and so that's even more important as we move into mid fall and late fall you you, you got to be prepared to, to to tough it out yeah that's the same thing we had yesterday actually the first few fish we got um you know, ironically wouldn't take a leech but they would still um take a chronum and pupa and when we did you know careful throat pump analysis actually there was nothing in them maybe a little zooplankton which is sort of typical early early fall right because they're transitioning out of that deep water where that zoo, zooplankton's most yep. abundant and and then the boatman and back swimmers started to move a little bit, not a lot, but enough to get a few fish up on the surface to show and to be 
frankly, too hard to resist. <laughs> Got to put the <laughs> indicator rod down and the long leader nymphing rod down for and, and pull out the the uh, hover or clear intermediate and, and um, get them with that. And we still had a little bit of bloom on the lake on there, but it's going to start getting better and better. And we find, I don't know about your lakes, Brian, but we find our lakes early in the season, those boatman and um, back swimmer um, uh, activity, those, those uh, my, you know, mating and migration flights and falls are maybe go from one till four as the day's still warm. But as that season gets cooler, those windows get narrower and narrower yeah. and then they stop. But thankfully the fish still remember that they were a pretty good eat um, for yeah. a while, maybe a week or two ago, and we'll still respond to them. But uh, right now that first in our neck of the woods where I'm in Alberta, that sort of uh, first week, you know, the first two weeks after Labor Day are prime boatman and back swimmer activity uh, yeah. in our neck of the yeah. woods. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, I mean, it's something that we look forward to every year. And uh, it, it just it just sets it's setting the stage for fall, and uh, you know once we get over that that boatman and back swimmer fall, we we're now sliding into the mid fall period, and uh, so now we're we're definitely seeing water temperatures uh, down in the 50s Fahrenheit, and uh, of course we're all waiting for the ideally for those water temperatures to slide down below 50 and yeah. that's once we get below 50 that's definitely the that's the initiation initiation of the late fall season but the mid season offers a lot of uh i mean the fish are now aggressive they're now moving into shallower water so we're going to be spending a lot more time in 15 feet of water or less and uh you know it, it, those leeches and scuds uh, and even, uh, you'll catch really aggressive fish on boobies if they're not mm -hmm. keying on the leeches or scuds, but it's, it's definitely leech time, scud times. And then oddly enough, we, we, we do get some, some really good fishing with juvenile or immature, um, mayfly nymphs hmm. at that mid fall time. For some reason on a lot of lakes, we do, you do see a, like we're still seeing that second hatch of mayflies right now on some lakes and they're, the adults are pretty small, you know, they're like a 16, uh, but they'll, you know, they know what the nymphs look like. And so, yeah. you know, again, like we always say, Phil, it's, man, uh, look on, look on the water, look, look over the water, look under in the water. It's going to yeah. tell you so much. Yeah. And it, we don't have the mayfly populations in our, our lakes, but you know, as, as fall progresses, and I remember last year we had a warm spell that actually broke the lake up and we could get back out and we knew it wasn't going to last long. So we were out there, you know, took a few sick days and uh, uh, got out on the water. And I just fished because I can fish multiple flies. I fished a small micro leech above, uh, sorry, below a blob uh, under an indicator system because the water temperatures were in the low 30s. So the fish oh. are slowing down. And they're starting to slide out of the shallows. And I didn't change flies for two straight days. All And I didn't change depth either. I just changed locations a little bit. And that's all I needed to do. So it was kind of easy on the just paying attention to where you saw fish and, and targeting those likely looking areas. Yeah, um, yeah. There was a question here. One of the things we mentioned too is uh, you mentioned 50 Fahrenheit, which is also an important spring temperature, right? That's when things yep. get going. Yep. So it's, I think it's important for everybody to remember that 50, um, 50 Fahrenheit. But there was a question, they're starting to roll in now, about throat pumping. Um, and we both believe in careful use of that. Uh, David Aragon here, is a good idea to pump the stomach? Um Yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, throat, throat pumping. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, we're, 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 you know, we call it a throat pump, not a stomach pump, because we are sampling the upper part of the, the gullet and the throat uh, because we want live food items mm -hmm. to come into the tube. And uh, so I, like, I, I, that little video I sent you yesterday, of that boat of that back swimmer um you know that i that's that's a back swimmer i got in my throat pump and i honestly think that's the first back swimmer i've ever gotten in it it must have lined up perfectly to get it into the pump uh but that's what you want to see is live food samples uh when you do a throat pump uh properly and that fish is going to survive 
And so uh, doing throw pumps, regardless of the time of the year, it, it can be an invaluable tool, yeah. but you got to use it properly. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, yeah, definitely got to use it properly, and, and like you say, because I think the directions actually suggest to to flush, you know, have yeah. it half full or full of water. And I don't think, you know, people might argue, well, we're already sticking it down its throat. Where's what now? Now you're showing a little compassion, but that. But I think most importantly, you could be flushing the very things you want to find right, right back down the throat, and you're gonna you're gonna get a an erroneous or a in, inaccurate sample. So. Uh, very important. But I, I don't know about you, Brian, but I tend not to pump as much as I do when the hatches are on. I usually the first fish of con of size um, gets a sample and, um, you know, and then base my decisions from there. Because like you said, they're grazing on those bread and butter food items. And you're just really trying to see if they're, you know, what they're feeding on, if they're actively feeding. Because like you said, with that, what we showed with that back swimmer, that, that that's alive. So you know that they're feeding. They'll take a back swimmer if one goes by them. Yeah. I mean, on a, on a typical mid-fall day, um, you may get zooplankton in the first fish you pump, and then you might, in the next fish, an hour or so later, it might have a few shrimp in it. Mm -hmm. But you, it, it's, it, and then you might see some baby damselflies in it, depending on the lake mm -hmm. you're on. So the, the selection isn't going to be huge on what you're going to pump. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're fishing less than half a dozen key patterns anyways mm -hmm. so you yeah. cycle through those patterns and and sooner or later you're going to get on to what they're uh what they're interested in yeah or hit them when they're just active right when they just the little light switch in their head switches yeah. on and, and they decide to feed for half an hour an hour or so um the question of why we were talking about boatman um and back swimmers too, because both the similar insect as far as presentation tactics. Uh, boatman able to be tied on an indicator setup, or is it strictly for stripping line? Um, that's from Logan, who I I saw you out on the lake yesterday, Logan. So <laughs> he had a good day too. He he was playing with chironomids as well. Yeah. Um, Brian, I, I fish them under an indicator, but I probably strip them most often because they're a pretty active little critter. And and once you get that grab, yeah. Pretty addictive uh, yeah. to stare at an indicator or get a good tug. Yeah. I mean, I think overall stripping them, even even on a uh, a floating line or, or a nymph tip or a merger tip, yeah. uh, it is uh, it, it just covers the water the column better, yeah. certainly with the full sinking lines. But I've had I've had numerous guests in the boat in the fall period when they're on boatmen. And they can't cast sinking lines, so yeah. it's you put them on the indicator and you get them. You get yeah. fish. Yeah, it's um, you know, where I am, you know, <laughs> I can fish multiple flies, so I love to fish. <laughs> I like to rub <laughs> it in when I can, right? <laughs> you got more lakes than I got, but I got two flies. Um, but I like to fish a washing line setup. So for those of you unfamiliar with it and are in areas where you can fish multiple flies, first of all, always check your regulations. Um, that's having a buoyant fly on the point, and then one or two, depending on your regulations, uh, normal regular flies, a bead head on separate droppers in between the point fly at the end of your leader and your fly line. And I love to fish this time of the year with a boatman back swimmer combo. Then I put the back swimmer, I tend to fish one. Um, we sell it on our online store, the Greater Water Floatman. It's on my YouTube channel, and that's got a foam back on it, so it, it suspends. And then just a pattern like my Tin Man or Brian's Yellow Water Boatman or Peacock Boatman and hang that off a dropper and strip it. And the combination of the intermediate line, because boatmen and back swimmers are air breathers, so they, they're constantly coming up to the surface. So they tend to be in the shallows, so although you certainly see those movements over deep water too. And um, it just keeps them both uh, above and off, off structure and keeps them tracking just below the surface, depending if you're fishing a floating line or a mid or a merger tip like Brian mentioned, or a hover line, and uh, you get the boats, because I've found at times I'll eat a back swimmer for half an hour, and all of a sudden they like the water boatman for half an hour, and they can flip and flop back and forth, and I've got both flies in the water, and let them choose the one they want for that moment, so it's a great technique. Yeah, and I, and I think just a couple more points on that uh, mid-fall period. Uh, re actually, regardless of what period it is in the fall, got to be prepared to change flies, mm -hmm. change tactics. You've narrowed down the zone where the fish are going to be 
cheating, you know, it's shallow water. And so uh, just, you know, if they won't take a leech, put the shrimp on. They won't take the shrimp, or if you try it with shrimp and it doesn't work, put the leech on or go go to blobs uh, mm -hmm. or go to the edge of the drop off and see if you can enter something in a, in a, in a booby. Just just so that you can get a fish, that first fish that's big enough, and that you can safely do a throat pump on him, and uh, to to help you start nowering it down. But you know, be prepared to to uh, move a lot, and uh, mm -hmm. change flies and yeah. change lines. Yeah, it's a good question here. We didn't we mentioned the food sources, the staple items, but one we sort of forgot that's definitely on that list are bloodworm or coronamid larva, right? And still a good producer, especially oh. I find early early season when the fish are transitioning out of the deep water where they've been feeding on them in the summer months and that mid fall period, you can have some fantastic yeah. fishing on bloodworm patterns. Yeah, I know right now on on a number of lakes in my area that you know, hanging hanging a bloodworm just off the bottom and big ones. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is very productive and on some of our lakes even in deep water we're dangling down you know 26 27 feet and uh yep. you know you you, you you catch a fish land it and pump it and it's got half a dozen three quarter to one inch long yeah beautiful blood worms in them well that's so, pre yeah. that's primo blood worm habitat yeah. isn't it that rich muddy oh, yeah. bottom absolutely that's rich buddy. Okay, we got a question about scuds as we're bouncing around the food sources. Do we actively <laughs> fish them? And remember, Brian, my wife will be watching this perhaps <laughs> later, and, and she knows about your your, yeah. your slow evolution into a loving yeah. fishing scuds. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I, I was just saying. I, yeah, you know, I just just didn't have a. I, I had to develop an acquired taste for <laughs> scuds, and now I I fish them a lot. Yeah. Uh, uh, usually the towards uh, you know the last bit of the mid season and then heavily into the late fall season and uh, honestly the past several years the biggest fish I've caught have been in the late fall and they've been on shrimp um, in five feet of water three and a half feet of water so it's just but we we just we gotta fish shrimp a little bit outside the box in that and by that i mean it's casting and retrieving on either a dry line hover line emerger tip or your intermediate or type one three sinking or type three sinking lines but we're going to speed the retrieve to sub supersonic fast short fast quick retrieves because they'll chase a fleeing food source. So yeah. normally we're, we're fishing shrimp by a little bit slower hand twist retrieve, but as that water cools down and those fish move into shallow shard water, I think it's a good rule of thumb to speed that retrieve up. Faster is better. Yeah, I think so too. I, you know, because I think one of the things you always were concerned about with shrimp is just that mass population that's down there and your fly is... Yeah. amongst all those and even though our you know let's be real our flies don't always look you know they don't blend in quite that well but they just get lost in all that clutter so our flies moving a little faster like that choppy one inch pulls uh, aggressively through um just make i think makes them stand out too doesn't it and they just get noticed and get eaten yeah and, and we've you know we've got beads on our flies or or our materials that stand out a little bit more and mm -hmm. that's what sets it apart from the rest of the crowd and the other, the other thing I always do with shrimp in the fall is I beef up my tippet. Yeah. I'm using eight pound, eight and a half pound, uh, you know, good quality fluorocarbon, you know, tied on with a non-slip loop knot. But I'm not using six pound, you know, four X. I'm going three X or beyond because they'll and good hooks yeah. because uh, the take is, you know, when you have a potentially double digit fish grabbing on they're not sucking it in gently they're mm -hmm. chasing it down and they're gonna you know you'll you'll break them off if you don't have uh heavy enough tippet so beef it up a bit yeah yeah definitely those 2x heavy hooks like you and i like the daiichi hooks the 1120s scud hooks and the 
1762 X. I always get that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. They're yep. good uh, for fishing out there as well. So other food sources you mentioned as well. We've got immature damsels, immature dragons. Yeah. Um, there was and a leech. question question here on leeches, of course. I remember one important thing you were we were talking years ago, and you said to me um, before your um, newfound love for scuds was one of the things you when you, when we had scuds in the throat sample we knew those fish were eating and if you hung a micro leech down there i remember a, a trip we did up to sheridan when you were filming the show up there and they would eat you know they were in the shower wow. you could see those big brutes um rooting in the in the marl that um for the little tiny hyalella the little tiny shrimp and yet they would eat a, a micro leech if you got it down uh where they were cruising they they're so opportunistic at that time willing to feed yeah and it's the key is getting that leech down to the zone that they're feeding on and if they're on those scuds rooting in the marl you basically almost have to have the tail of your leech dragging in the marl and that's why a balanced leech under yeah, an indicator is so effective yeah and that was when we were there together we we didn't have balanced leeches no. you know weren't around then and i remember we actually had to set because the water's so clear we could actually lower our flies down on the shoal and because we were in what six eight feet of water if that yeah. and, and and our flies touch you could see them just kiss the marl and set the indicator yeah. there and that's what took them not a not six inches off the bottom not a foot they had to basically skip and touch the bottom um for the fish to to notice them and maybe it created a plume we didn't know but uh that that was the way we had to be successful it was a bit of a no, learning yeah, no, it, on that day. and that that holds true on any marl lake that I fish, when those fish are on there, you want that leech dragging the bottom to the marl and creating that little dust trail. And then that's what brings those fish. Yeah. Yeah. There's a couple more questions. Good one here um, from Patrick Gilmore. Uh, what's our favorite go-to color for scuds? Well, I certainly, I, I like different shades of green but i like uv yeah. in the material and so uh there, there's uh just th th there's um plastic ice chenilles with uv in them there's straggle string with uv in them in yeah. light all of the dark olive and when you tie them up they they look almost like they're too purplish in color but when they're wet in the water they turn a dark olive green and so, uh, you know, I'm a real fan of having, like you, I'm sure of having some UV yeah. material in the straggle string or the chenille. Yeah, or even ice stub. Um, made that ice stub. Color. Yep. Yeah. And, and I, it, one of the things I learned with um, back when I, I worked for a fly time, just, you know, materials distributor, when you first saw the UV, it looked purple and almost too much and, and just didn't look right. And then you hold it up, you know, against a light source and it just turns into that beautiful dark olive. That's um, right. You know, I tend... I tend to fish a darker colors in more of your, you know, our lakes are kind of mud bottomed, lots of dark weeds. So I tend, you know, you want to try and match the um, coloration of the, their surroundings. And then of course in the Marl lakes, they tend to be a little lighter, yeah. a little, you know, light olives um, as well. So just uh, weeds are always a good, in, and you know, and the surroundings are always a good in, um, indication of what flies you could use. Um, okay. Um, there was some, um, Oh, the, just the question more about UV as effective in shallow water versus deep water scud patterns. You know, I, I mean, there's, there's, there's lots of various opinions, scientific mm -hmm. opinions on whether adult fish, trout, salmon, it can see UV. It, uh, I mean, everybody seems to agree in, in the scientific community that juveniles up yeah. to about age two can, can see ultraviolet. I like ultraviolet in all my materials, yeah. <laughs> yeah. from from leeches to scuds to damselflies. Uh, I like putting it in and uh, having that in the material, and uh, and I'm fishing them in deep or shallow water. It doesn't matter. Yeah, and it's important. I think that UV is kind of two things: is the reflectiveness, this that what people believe fish can or can't see, and as you mentioned, it, it's mostly in it's in the juvenile fish because the cones in their eyes. Um, transition into those um, um, violet, right? Rods. Yeah, blues. Yeah, and but to me, fluorescence is important. I, I more and more nowadays, I have a lot of fluorescent orange beads or chartreuse, just a hot spot 
a little touch, and I, I believe it really makes a difference. Um, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm a big believer in those, you know, not, of course, then you go to the, the boobies and the fabs and the blobs, and they're way over on the fluorescence. Um, but, um, you know, that's, you know, in my leech patterns, a lot of short, you know, we're talking like, va- you know, Todd's vampire leech. Um, we both got patterns of our own. We put those fluorescent uh, chartreuse and uh, hot orange beads on and even hot pink make uh, and uh, make yeah. a big difference. Make a big you difference. Bet. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, just a few. Oh, uh, I'll like answer this one. Trolling from Steve. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. I don't like to troll very much. It's a great method to cover water and fine fish, but uh, trolling certainly certainly works because you're covering water. Any, oh, yeah. rec- any recommendations there, Brian, to help him? You know, trolling? if I was trolling on the uh, and there was fish on the edge of the drop off and in shallower. Uh, I'd I'd be ha- I'd be putting a vampire leech on with a yeah. chartreuse green bead, yeah. And uh, that that leech troll, I know I, I see people doing it. It's it's deadly. Yeah, it's it's a very effective pattern. Well, leeches swim out in the open. Um, yep. You know, I, in my neck of the woods, we've got many of our lakes have small minnows in them, fathead minnows and stickleback. And I remember bringing the boat up yesterday to uh, recover it. And the shoreline is, you know, they're at the peak of their growth. So they are crowding the shallows, like less than four inches of water, huge schools of them because they know they can't go out. They've learned the hard way that they can't go out too much deeper because the browns and the tiger trout and the rainbows that are in there, you know, that's, that's really good protein um, for a growing fish. Just like you and I like our sushi. I guess they do too. Yeah. Right? Um, <laughs> Yeah, and a question here. Um, that was a great question, Steve. Um, soggy sleeves. Uh, how does low clear water of late and fall affect the amount of flash you incorporate into your flies? You know, I think if it was in the springtime, it would it would be an it could be a potential issue. But in the fall, because we're fishing so many patterns with a quick retrieve, it's all about all about having an aggressive fish yeah. uh, chase down your pattern. So I, 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 I don't change the amount of flash in, in low clear water. Uh, it's it's putting a food source in front of their face uh, because they gotta eat, and uh, I, I think that's that's the bottom line. Yeah, I, I yeah definitely agree. I think some maybe in the spring sometimes when they're you know a little more wary or if they're really spooky, I might tone the flash down a little bit with more natural imitations no. just a little i like a lot of you know, like um pearlescent um flashaboos and mylars particularly the uh, mirage opal just a touch right just to catch the light and sort of let the trout know there's something over there to eat but not going by like a street sign but in the fall when they're so aggressive that can actually be a trigger for them as well so um yeah uh, you also like to fish dragons too don't you brian oh dear here yeah, Love gompus. fishing gompus. Deer hair yeah. dragonflies are an excellent pattern to fish in the early and mid fall period, partic- but particularly during the early fall period. And uh, you could be fishing them on type five, type seven lines in deeper water. Um, and that's assuming that you're fishing a lake that even though it's got a thermocline, there's still oxygen below that thermocline because you're seeing the fish on your sounder, right? Mm-hmm. You know, we haven't mentioned how valuable a depth sounder is, but yeah, you know, we you ne- never leave home without it. You need a good sounder. Yeah. Uh, it it they're game changers now, Phil, uh, uh, and uh, you don't have to spend a ton of money to get a good sounder. That's really going to help improve your. Uh, your game on the water. Yeah, we had uh, Andrew Humphreys. We both know Andrew. He's a hummingbird uh, rep, and I had him on here uh, for a a session like this. And if you missed it, I really recommend um, you watch it. It's on my YouTube channel. Uh, Pick it up because Andrew is a whiz on those things. I learned a ton talking to him. Every time I talk to him, I learn more about my sound because there's so many things it can do. Um, you know, finding fish is just one thing a sounder can do for you. It's such a powerful tool to have out there uh, with you. And great to see that our balance leeches, our balance leeches working in New Zealand, Brian. So that's good to hear. Oh yeah. 
Yeah, I have to get down there. I keep seeing awesome. all those big still water. I know you've been there. I haven't had the good fortune to get there yet. Too busy in Argentina, hoping to get back there soon. Oh, here's a the dreaded full moon question. Great question. <laughs> um, night fishing at this time of the year and into the fall with larger tractors. So I'm assuming boobies, um, blobs, fabs, watsits, those kind of things during the full moon effective. Very little info um, that I found online. Yeah, I mean, that's, it, it makes sense that it would, you're still going to be fishing those attractor patterns at night. Uh, and the fish are just going to be that much more aggressive uh, a bit, uh, at, at, during the fall period. Yeah. Although you and I aren't necessarily the biggest fans of full moons, are we? We like that period up to the full moon. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Um, oh, and there was a question up before, and... Uh, about snails, have we ever um, run across those uh, as a consistent fall pattern? I haven't. I have run across them, and I, I have a simple little peacock-bodied snail pattern that, I'll, that I use. I'm going to feature it later on this fall when I get behind the vise again and start tying on, on my YouTube channel. What about you, Brian? You know, I, I've, I, I've had very little experience fishing snail patterns yeah. at this you know, sometimes we know they're in them because, and then particularly, actually, it's because it's a good question because in the early fall, a lot of, I know some, in a lot of lakes, uh, the fish will start going on snails and you can see their bellies are mm -hmm. got bumps and you can, you can feel the texture of their yeah. stomach through their uh, body wall and, uh, you know, it's full of snails and, uh, um, it's probably something we should spend more or spend more yeah. time on, but I am. Yeah, they're a bit like a maraca, and I think we also noticed too that they're the opposite end to their mouth because we rated G here is a little red and swollen, <laughs> <laughs> as you can imagine. Because they only eat the. It's. I think it's important to note that they only eat the the small ones, right? The the little yeah. ones about the size of your thumb, uh, your pinky nail, are smaller because they just can't pass. They don't pass. They don't digest the shell. Those get past and it's interesting um i was out with my two sons brandon and sean yesterday and brandon mentioned because it was something um drifting by the boat and i didn't have my glasses on and so i asked him what they were and he said they were snails and they were little ones just on the meniscus on the underside of the surface yeah. film and we did have some fish coming up and, and porpoising and and you know we were being successful with the, the pupil chronomid pupa patterns down deep so I didn't you know really target them but that's a classic example of what you just talked about in that early uh, fall period, just when the lakes are coming out of summer. Yeah. And Logan makes a good point because Logan was on the same lake I was and uh, lots and lots of snails in their belly. So it's something I think we should experiment with more. Well, you know, I, I can see it in the wintertime too, because it's, it's, it's an available food source, but it's got to be sure hard on them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was a bit like me and eating jalapeno peppers. <laughs> Starts out okay, but after a while, it's not so much fun anymore, especially the following days. So we touched on some fly lines. Let's talk about some of our, our gear we like to use, our line choices. Um, for the most part, we're fishing shallow, correct? Although we will bring out the fast sinking line. So why don't we talk about that and sort of work our way down from the surface, um, you know, to our faster sink rate lines and, and what we like to choose and use. Yeah, no, no, certainly you've got to go out on the water with, with more than just your floating line mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the intermediate, the Aqualux clear camel, those intermediate sinking lines that sink up to about one point between 1.5 and 1.75 inches per second. Mm -hmm. And then your type threes, type fives, type sevens, all, all come into play or potentially could come into play on a day in the water, particularly in the early fall season. Yeah. And, and then I, and we both experience it as we move into the mid to late fall period. Uh, our, our lines tend to be, uh, we don't have to carry as many. We're, we're definitely fishing type threes, intermediates, floating lines, because in, we're fishing shallower and shallower water. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm the same way. You know, the floating line is always there, you know, with and without indicators um, because we can, we touched on boatmen and back swimmers. We can strip those around with a floating line or a midge tip or an emerger tip. 
um, to target those fish that are just beneath the surface, hover lines, clear intermediates. But we still have the fast sinkers, right? Because you can fish um, buoyant um, boatman and back swimmer patterns and let the line Absolutely. drag them down. And actually, the way, especially that we, you know, the newer, um, I, I use a lot of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm with the other company, Brian Rio. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I like their clean sweep lines, and I, I believe Scientific Anglers has a uh, has a similar line that has different sink rates along its length to induce um, a U shaped uh, path. You know, I re I've really used those lines a lot this year. Um, fishing out in deep water where you can sweep flies through a variety of depths to find fish, and of course in the fall months when they're on those boatman and backswimmer patterns, the, the travel, the line. The, the path that those lines travel really does a great job of simulating that boatman or back swimmer that's come up, you know, hit the surface, come to the surface, got that, you know, dove back in or gone up for a, another replenishment of air and then scoots back down to the bottom. It's just a great line to use in those scenarios. But we also, I guess to me, the floater, when the colder it gets, the more I'm on the indicator because the fish just, you know, and then they start to right at the tail end of the season, it's, it, you know, they're, I, you know, the example I talked about earlier on, they hardly move. That indicator would just slide to the left or the right. It wouldn't pull down. It may go half down because the, you know, the take was so, um, so slow, you know, as that water temperature got um, cooler and cooler and cooler. And that's where those, that indicator technique really comes in when the fish just will not eat um, anything moving. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all water temperature dependent. And then yeah. when that water starts to super cool, that gear, the, the trout gear down in their activity levels and they won't chase. And again, as you said, that's why that indicator, and, and a lot of times, in a lot of seasons that we fish, that's the last line we got out is the yeah. indicator before we wind them up for the season. Yeah, yeah. Um... Are, are nine foot sink tips enough to get the fly down when using a floating line? I, I assume, Patrick, are you, I'm going to, the loop to loop ones like Versi tip or um, um, those kind of leaders you loop on. Um, sometimes I, I just don't like, I, I use those more of a travel option. I tend to like, a, you know, a line that's, you know, fully, you know, no loops in it as far as connecting different line densities. That's just my personal thing. Don't, read anything bad into it no. um but um they, they certainly work in, in some situations you know i'm thinking a boatman and my and uh yeah. back swimmer would be the first nope. one off the top of my head but when we're fishing patrick when we're fishing say we're fishing in seven feet of water uh you're better off fishing with a full sinking line and retrieving that shrimp or leech than with a sinking tip line because it the angle is different. Mm -hmm. the, the, the full sinking line is going to keep your fly down along the bottom. And moving the horizontally. Bottom, moving hor exactly, moving horizontally. Whereas your sink tip, uh, floating line with a sinking tip, it's it it's going to retrieve your fly on an upward angle, and it, it it's it's not that horizontal movement, which is the zone that those fish are in. So that's why a full sinking line, even if it's just an intermediate sinking line, in many situations is a better option. Yeah, 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 I, I, that's, I, I just love the the horizontal, you know, because just about every food source we imitate, with the exception of chronomids and maybe caddis and, yeah, yeah. and, and mayfly nymphs as they're ascending to the surface is, is horizontal. That's why, again, those balanced flies work so well under an indicator because of the horizontal posture um, that they provide to your uh, to your presentation as well. Um, there's a question here, just a little outside of the lines, that, and I missed it on John earlier. Hi, John, how are you doing? Um, John was asking about, you know, particularly in your neck of the woods, Brian, what impact um, this unfortunately heavy fire season you guys have been experiencing there is going to have on the lakes, um, and and because he's coming up in October, and was just a little curious on the impact and. Um, and that'll dovetail into this question as well about what dates uh, signify in, yeah. your, in your diary and your altitude. Um, so you know, I you know we're just we're just entering uh, early fall right now, mm -hmm. and uh, I would say that's going to go until like the third week of September, and then the mid fall from third week of September of September till about the middle of October, 
and then depending on elevation of the lake, right? Because the higher you go in elevation, the quicker they're going to cool down. But that fall period for the majority of lakes in and around the Kamloops area that we fish, it's it's that last two last ten days of October till we freeze up, depending on the elevation. Yeah, m mine are very similar. We're in the same transition, and I think because I'm further north than, than you, and closer to the Arctic, um, <laughs> um, it's uh, that latter part of October. When we slide off the shelf in the winter, we go. Um, and, you know, we can have, you know, nice warm days, and then two days later it's yeah. 13, 13 <laughs> Celsius below. It's done and and fast. And uh, so we, you know, last year we had – you. I in my neck of the woods, it's usually any time after October 3rd, 31st, I'm on borrowed time and appreciating every day I can get out on the water. The first part of John's question, O'Brien, was about the forest fires. For those wanting to come up and, and visit British Columbia and the wonderful still water fishing you have there, what impact do you think these fires are going to have on that? Well, you know, I, I think the uh, the long term, well, the short term effect is, you know, we, we've had lakes that have burned right around mm -hmm. the whole entire shoreline. In fact, the whole watershed's been burned. And so it's going to definitely impact the water chemistry in the short term. But over the long term, things are going to change. We're, we're you potentially over the long term see uh, slight shifts in uh, the uh, species of uh, vegetation living in the lake because the pH is going to change a bit. It could have an impact on um, uh, the, uh, the diversity of species diversity of chronomids, say, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, got a lot of ash there. We don't have a lot of live trees in the watershed. So spring runoff is going to just rip into the lake. The lakes are going to get intense flushing actions. And they're going to they're going to bring a lot of nutrients uh, in the soil that's got nothing, no you know, no vegetation to hold it in, and so uh, it, it, it's very similar, but uh, but exponentially worse than than an entire watershed being logged. Uh, mm -hmm. Now we've got nothing alive in there, uh, and so uh, yes, unfortunately, we we are going to see some changes to those lakes. And uh, some of it will be gradually over time, but uh, next spring things could be quite different in terms of water quality on a, on a number of lakes in the southern interior. That that the area that got hit the hardest. Yeah, well, you you saw it firsthand. On you mentioned earlier your favorite lake, Roche Lake, because Roche used to be very clear, and with the impact of the pine beetle and the removal of those dead trees, more and, and more logging. nutrients came in the lake. The lake yep. started to become more eutrophic, and I noticed the last time I was out there, it was murkier. The weed growth had changed. You yeah. don't see those Kara and Marl shoals no. anymore. It's changed, no. right? So that's no. just an oh, indication. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's significant, yeah. Okay, a couple of the questions here, because we're almost coming up to the hour. We've got seven or eight minutes. We're not, you know, one minute over, we're done, but just want to make sure we get everybody's questions in. What water temperature do you consider early fall, mid fall, and late fall? So early fall, it would be, I mean, it, I would say 63 Fahrenheit down to 58 in that range. Yeah. Mid fall, 58 down to like uh, 50. Yeah. And then late fall, it's the 40s. And the prime slice of the pie in late fall is... 42 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. That's mint. That's that. That's a mint window to be on the on the lakes. Once you get below 40, then you you risk uh, the lakes are now starting to super cool, and uh, and uh, the fish, you know, are go are going to start getting a bit more lethargic. Uh, but remember, those lakes have still got to turn over. Um, yeah. well they also i found they start to slide out into you know the first part of winter where they're gonna um you know spend the part in a little deeper water yeah until, they go back out yeah yeah so instead of you know i, I remember fishing a, a lake in my neck of the woods you know a week before it was in that just coming tail end of that mid 
fall period and they were in shallow and we went back there a week later and they weren't and instead of fishing in six or eight feet we were now back fishing in 10 or 12 yeah. uh, right next to drop-offs and that made a huge difference um, to our success rate. So, yeah, cause I think everybody sort of gets trapped into moving, moving, moving until they're almost fishing from shore, which you certainly can do sometimes, um, but to slide out as well. Um, Devin had a great question here. Uh, hi Devin. I uh, hope you're well. Um, a little bit more about talking about what's going on with back swimmers in the fall. I see them all year long, but there must be a migration that's happening fall. Are they mating in short? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So they're definitely, on mating flights and they'll fly from one lake to another to deposit eggs. So there's definitely a concerted movement of back swimmers yeah. and boatmen in that early fall period. Uh, and uh, that's that's why you're seeing raindrops on a nice sunny day is that mm -hmm. they're, um, they're on a mating swarming flight. Yeah. Uh, but, and as Devin has said, you, you know, you see them at all times of the year in lakes, but when they start popping out of the sky and hitting the water, uh, and that for that two week window, it just, it just gets the fish going. Yeah. Uh, they're there all the time, but it's those mating ones that, uh, just seem to get the fish aggressively to feed on them. This is like any hatch, right? You get a ton of one thing, you know, predominating in the water the fish are going to turn on because it, i think it's devon it's it's also important to know this happens in the early spring too right after <laughs> ice off because there are species that re, you know it's when they both boatmen and back swimmers can only fly when they reach full maturity the rest of the time is they're immature they're just scooting yeah, they around and capable of flight so it's it's that as brian said that splashing and crashing down that draws them in lakes and of course your pool too right brian i seem to recall you having to complain you had to fish them out of your pool <laughs> yeah. Cause they get yeah. any water will do right yeah, uh, any question, water. a question about coronamids here from lucas great question do coronamids hatch in different parts of the lake in the fall versus the spring so you know in the spring obviously the majority of hatches of coronamids occurs in on the shoal and then out into you know 20 20 feet of water. That's where the majority of hatches go. But in the fall, uh, you can honestly, you could have chronomids hatching at all depths. Mm -hmm. uh, and you tend to have more hatches coming off in the mid depth range. So like 15 to 25 feet in depth uh, versus five feet of water in the fall. But, uh, there's no set rule. And again, if you see yeah. shucks drifting by your boat and you're anchored in nine feet of water, you know, they got to be coming from somewhere. And yeah. um, it, so you always need to be on the lookout uh, for a potential hatch. And, and it could be at any depth. Yeah, because we're seeing right now we're in that early, you know, really early part of fall and we're still seeing some deep water emergences yeah. of coronamids. Yesterday I was fishing predominantly in 14 to 16, 17 feet, and they had big, honest size 10 scud hooks in them. Uh, not the hooks, but that size, an, an honest number 10 uh, coronamid pupa in them, and, and they were taking them well because those larger species tend, seem to live deeper, don't they? Yeah. Um, just some other questions here. Um, oh, one about our favorite kind of lines. One of our favorite midge tip or emerger tip lines are terrific. Why aren't they catching on here in the States? They don't catch on as much as you and I would like them. I'm always scared they're going to discontinue them on us, but uh, no, uh, they're super popular in, in England in particular. Yeah, they, you know, the midge tip line for real, the emerger tip for scientific anglers, they're hugely popular in the UK, as, mm -hmm. as you've said, Phil, the UK is the birthplace of still water fly fishing. Yep. They know yep. what's going on. We know what's going on because we've learned from them. And uh, yeah, I, it, it, there's such an effective line for so many different yep. applications. I, yep. I, don't, I honestly don't know why they're, yep. uh, they're not uh, more yeah, popular. I'm, yeah, I made a 
a point, a little self-promotion in my new book of, <laughs> of focusing on the midge tip and its different applications because it's such a valuable line. It has so many different uses, so many different applications from fishing coronamids to fishing dry flies, if you can believe it, to fishing boatmen and backstormers, fishing leeches, damsels, make windy Very conditions. Flies, it's, got, it's got application not only for different food types, it's got different tactical advantage to it. There's just so many um, good reasons um, to use a midge tip. Uh, great question. Oh, a, a good question here because I get asked this a lot about why don't, you know, and I guess this, I'm assuming, Brian, this pertains to um, summer kills. Um, why we don't use aeration um, for for aerating lakes in the summer. And that can be pretty lethal if you do that, right? Yeah, you know, aerating in the midsummer months, you know, when you're dealing with a thermocline um, and changing water chemistry and oxygen levels below the thermocline, it it it's a little it can be a little dicey, and uh, I you know uh, fall late fall aeration and then winter aeration, if it's done properly, should significantly help a lake to set up for spring and get it through the summer months. Um, so, you know, playing, playing with aeration midsummer is, is a bit dicey. It can be done, but man, you, yeah. you, you gotta, you gotta pay attention to what you're doing and regularly checking oxygen levels, uh, oh. uh, on a regular basis throughout the water column. Yeah. Because you've got that warm, reduced <clears throat> oxygen content at the start, you know, above the thermocline and you mix that yeah, anoxic yeah. water yeah. below the thermocline, you just made a bad situation worse yeah. by making the whole lake anoxic. Um, great question here from Joe. In the UK, they fish the apps, the apps worm. Will they work here? How'd you learn about that, Joe? You're not supposed to know about that. Yes, they work very well. I don't know if you tried those yet, Brian, but uh, I've got a friend in, in uh, Wales, Reese. He's got a YouTube channel, Reese Fishes. Uh, you should check it out if you want to learn more about the apps worm. But it's basically like a blood worm with really long um, super floss, span flex tails, like three times the shank yeah. length out the front. You can fish them under an indicator. You can fish them slow retrieves. But I was out east earlier this year fishing that um, um, clean sweep line and stripping them like – you would strip a booby and holy Hannah, did they like that? So, you know, yeah. it's, it's just I've been trying to keep it sort stuff. of secret because I've been having fun playing with it and Panasks, Brian, will eat them. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's, you know, that just tells you it's, it's something totally different, yeah. totally out of the box. And the fish yeah. have never seen them before. Yeah. And I think so, the pace, you're just triggering. It may not, you know, yeah. they may not, I don't think they're actually taking it at that pace like anything. As a feeding, it you just yeah. they're aggressive and you trigger that predatory yeah. behavior and they just instinctively rat you know, we've all had times where we reel in a coronamid at warp speed to move and you hook a fish. Well, we know yeah. coronamids don't move like that, but that coronamid pupa just tracked yeah. by their snout at warp speed and they just snapped at it. So um, yeah, so uh, I think we've covered every question. We've tried tonight to go through. Brian did a great job, um, again, helping with the biology and really understanding the fall season turnover, um, how this, how we break the seasons into three distinct periods, sort of the early season, mid-season, and late season, and, and how things change over there, because you will see those changes. Uh, we talked a little bit about the fly lines we like to use and uh, the retrieves and uh, you know our retrieves basically for me they I match the water temperature the cooler it is generally the slower i go but there are those exceptions like we just mentioned with the apps worm where you can strip it around at pace um there was a question about what's our some of our favorite scud patterns um and some leech patterns so we could touch about those for a second brian your favorite scud flies oh you know what just uh, anything with UV in them yeah. is, 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 is the bottom line. Uh, and, you know, having, having a shell back on them and, or uh, of uh, uh, stretch, 
scud back material or yeah. just using uv glue over the back uh you know finishes the fly off well yeah i don't think you have to get too complicated sometimes particularly the smaller flies i just put dubbing on a hook yeah. run some wire through it yeah. give it a brush out cut away everything that doesn't look like a scud and go fishing yeah. Right. Really simple stuff. Um, yeah. So it's more about the presentation than the fly. I think the poor fly takes a lot of heat um, when things aren't working. Um, usually, as Brian mentioned earlier, it's about changing what you're doing, changing your lines, changing your retrieves, changing your location uh, more than it's about changing flies all the time. So, um, oh, a question about which end of the lake, which lake of end of Roche do we like to fish? Both no, fish at all. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, you know, I'll check out the whole lake when I'm out there because uh, it can be good at both ends. It could both, all of, you know, really, it's it's such a. And the main reason why Roche is my favorite lake is just it's got so much good trout habitat, mm -hmm. all parts of that lake. Yeah. Uh, question here from Bob. Another great, getting some great questions here. Everybody takes the time to give us a question we really appreciate it they're they're so good it makes us think which is good um how often do you use a balance leech to imitate a minnow or a stickleback versus a leech and um, what colors do you like for each purpose well as i mentioned we've got minnows brook stickleback and fatheads and a lot of times those minnows they they're they inhabit the margins um they're not an open water species and if they were they probably wouldn't survive very long um, but they're dark olive in coloration with a little bit of flash in them sometimes. So a lot of times I think they're eating an olive or a brown leech. They could be taking it as a stickleback or a fathead minnow imitation, but I do tie some balanced minnows as well. Um, John Romer, we both love, Brian and I both love his, his semi-seal dubbing as, as well as we love other dubbing mixes out there as like Chinook Winds and some of the stuff out of Togans and all that good stuff. There's so many good dubbings nowadays, um, but he has an actual fathead minnow color that I use um, quite a bit. And I've got those patterns on my YouTube channel. If you want to have a look at them, very simple leech like flies just tied in minnow combinations. And, and I will throw eyeballs on them. Just, I don't know if it's a hundred percent important, but I like them. So I think I fish them a little better, a little more intensive uh, that way. So. Oh, and speaking of minnows and stuff, there was a question from uh, in your neck of the woods, a Paul McCluskey's um, about Paul Lake and the shocking therapy. How effective? I guess they're doing some shock therapy, shocking for the get reduce the red sided shiner population. Brian, yeah, it's it's been going on for several years where we've got uh, a fishery consultant that lives on Paul Lake using his shocker boat, and uh, you know the reports I am hearing is that it's. It, it, it's it's going to make a difference. And uh, th those red-sided shiners school up at certain times of year. And when you put that chalker boat through them, you can really reduce the biomass of uh, maturing uh, male and female uh, shiners. Uh, and the same thing goes for uh, uh, goldfish in uh, Dragon Lake. They've been using the chalker boat up there. And uh, it, it's definitely going to make a a dent on the population and uh, uh, certainly I, I'm already hearing some much better reports on Paul on the, the condition factor of the rainbows is starting to come back, which is really, really good news. Yeah, that, that that's great. And it's been a number of years since I fished Paul Lake and ironically, I fished it with Shiner patterns <laughs> with Gord Honey, Lake, Lake Gord Honey. Last question about Roche, Brian, where's Monster Bay? <laughs> Should we Monster uh, Bay, Cabin Bay, we call it the... I mean, what we refer to Monster Bay is when you're heading down the lake from the resort. Uh, Monster Bay is the bay that those uh, two little private cabins are on that peninsula, that little point. Uh, it's the bay just immediately south of them is yeah. what we call Monster Bay, or, or some people call it Cabin Bay as well. Yeah. So it's that big bay just past those two private cabins on the west side of the lake. Yeah, it's on the right hand side, right? Yeah. As you're heading down. <clears throat> okay. I think we managed to get through all the questions, which is great. Um, thanks everyone for the positive feedback that you give. I'm glad you guys are enjoying these. Brian and I enjoy uh, doing them as as um, we will be out fishing hard the next two months or so, trying to get as much <laughs> as we can uh, fall wise in, but we'll be uh, back on here um and uh do some more of these if you want to see more of these please let us know please let me know in the comments 
uh, section of, of potential subjects you'd like to see. Um, I'm even capable of, you know, I've done some fly tying ones. I'm happy to do those again. Um, just want to thank everybody for watching. Hopefully you enjoy these. Again, this will be recorded and available on both my Phil Rowley Facebook page and my YouTube channel. If you haven't gone over there, please subscribe. It sure helps uh, algorithm and other things that I don't really understand all that well, but I'm told that's good. So again, if you've got questions, uh, put them in the comments as well and we can get to them or I can get to them. Thanks everybody for watching. Stay safe and enjoy the fall season. Get out there because... It isn't going to last long, but if you get out there, it's going to be good. So thanks, yeah. everyone, and uh, we'll see you next time. Tight lines.